All right. Um, so again, I want to welcome everybody um, to the laryngology version of our kind of COVID-related grand rounds. Um, and this has kind of been an interesting time for everybody, but it's also been an opportunity. So I want to thank uh, you know David Haynes and and Dr. Evie for you know having the the uh, uh, thought to do this because I think th th these have been really great sessions. Um, so originally. This was done, or we were asked to do this in the in the mode of kind of our CISN panels. Um, so, since this, our meeting in in uh, Bale is typically case based, uh, that's what we're going to do. So, we're going to start off uh, with an airway case that Dr. Gelbard is going to be walking us through, and I want to welcome Dr. Uh, Alexander Hallel, uh, fondly known as Zandy, to our group. Uh, who is a, one of the airway surgeons up at Hopkins who's been collaborating uh, with us and specifically with Dr. Gelbard on some of the research. So uh, again, thank you, uh, Dr. Hillel, for joining us. And for the second case, which is going to be more of the voice-related topics, uh, I've, I've asked Sarah Rohde to pipe in because one of them has some uh, involvement with our potentially head and neck side of things. So I'm going to get her to pipe in later on. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Gelbard, and he's going to lead us through the beginning part. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Garrett. Um, just a case that I had recently that I thought highlighted some interesting topics and would be interesting to kind of get your perspective on, Zandi, as we walk our way through. So something that's pretty common to larger academic centers, I think, is a 50-year-old man with a history of diabetes and coronary artery disease who is really highly functional, but presented to the emergency department here in December, complaining of progressively worsening dyspnea and to the point where he can't even perform the activities of daily living. Uh, initially, he was involved in a motorcycle crash in July of 2019 and required a tracheostomy to wean from a vent for that. And in rehab, decannulated about a week after the initial trach procedure, only to rapidly develop um, dyspnea and shortness of breath. And this required uh, someone in an outside hospital to place a Montgomery T-tube for five weeks, remove the T-tube, close the fistula, and send him out. And over the next three months, he progressively had worsening shortness of breath. He was an active smoker uh, at about a pack a day for the last 30 years. So um, on physical exam, uh, some inspiratory strider evident. He was comfortable at rest without any tachypnea and he was maintaining his saturation. He had a mobile glottis on laryngoscopy at the bedside without evidence of PGS, uh, bilateral vocal fold mobility, or any real laryngeal findings. He had some basic blood work that the ER had drawn at the time with a CBC most notable for a, a red cell distribution with 15.1, which I know that that's not on everybody's radar, but I'll kind of highlight how I use that for these airway patients. Um, elevated, you know, nonspecific inflammatory markers with a high CRP of 12.2 and evidence of poor glycemic control just with a A1C of 7.3. He also had a CT, which I'll, I'll get to next. Um, so one question, Zandy, would be, this is uh, 6.30 p.m. on maybe a Thursday night and, you know, what's your criteria for going to the operating room? You know, what do you usually use as hard or soft criteria that says this needs to happen now or this can happen with my A team when everybody's kind of fresh in the morning? Yeah, I, I think the, um, well, thank you, Alex. Um, I, I think the, um, the longer I've managed airway patients, I think I've gotten a little, a little less, um, I, I, a little um, more liberal with watching them overnight. Um, I and the fact that he's comfortable at rest is, I think, a good sign. Um, to me, uh, the inspiratory strider is a concern. Uh, based on the story, I, I was concerned the nine-day intubation. I, it was good to hear that he's got bilateral vocal fold mobility. Um, but I would feel pretty comfortable probably watching him on the floor, um, perhaps in, in an ICU on a monitored bed. We don't have an IMC um, on our surgical side at Hopkins. And, um, and then taking him the next day. 
Yeah, I mean, I would have, a, I think, probably a pretty similar sentiment that uh, somebody that seems comfortable at rest is in a pretty good state. I guess probably when I was really thinking about this, what are things that make me feel like watching at night's okay? And that's the progressive long time course. And if it's somebody with more of an acute change, I would be a little bit more wary. But, you know, like you said, this guy is, is looking comfortable at rest. And, and I think there's a, a big difference uh, between a highly practiced team that's used to dealing with this in the morning and then, you know, the team at night. And the team at night's there for emergencies and they're great, but I, I think the, my best results would probably be in the morning the next day. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And it, it speaks to the whole team from your um, circulator to the um, scrub to the anesthesia team as well. Definitely. So he gets a non-contrasted scan. Um, well, first of all, this red cell distribution with this marker being elevated. Normal is about 12.5 or lower. So 15 is pretty high. And when we had looked before about um, the outcomes for our post-innovation tracheal stenosis patients and how they did post-operatively, Debbie Z, who is um, actually a resident with Dr. Hillel now at Hopkins, had done a really nice paper just looking at uh, covariates that seemed to influence outcome. It looked like an elevated red cell distribution width was a very progno poor prognostic feature for healing from airway reconstruction. Um, not to say that it was universal that people did poorly, but it's a risk factor and sort of factored into, you know, how I caution people and talk to them ahead of time. So that's quite high for this guy, even though he's a 50 year old, very functional person. Um, it kind of is this one strike against him. So we get our CT scan and it's moving quickly. I'll show it again. Pretty good laryngeal vault, pretty poor proximal trachea. I guess one question, Dr. Hillel, what do you feel like you're looking at when you're looking at these airway CTs? Are there certain things that your eyes are jumping to? Um, or is there a certain way that you feel like you're reading them? I think the biggest thing I'm looking for is what's the proximity to the cricoid as I think about open surgery. Um, his history is such that he already had a T-tube. Um, and, you know, again, a T-tube in for five weeks may mean something, may not. But what I'm thinking about is he had an intervention. Iatrogenic disease usually doesn't respond so well to dilation in my experience. And um, I think the, the more comfortable I've gotten with open airway surgery, it, it, you, you realize that it becomes a definitive um, proposition for the patient and a definitive option. While he has some risk factors, his smoking, his diabetes, um, his coronary artery disease, it's still probably his best bet to get him back on the motorcycle and living a normal life. Sure. Um, so that's what I would look for is what's the proximity to the cricoid are, are we going to be sewing to the cricoid or are we going to have to be cutting uh, the anterior aspect of the cricoid for our anastomosis? Yeah, uh, and I think those are really, really good points. Um, and, you know, for me, the, the same thing that you're saying, Zandy, about the relationship with the laryngeal structures, the actual anatomic injury, I think just on CT, a lot of times I'm looking at the position of the arytenoids they seem well supported and symmetric. Does that cricoid ring seem fully intact and unaffected? It's not thickened, uh, hypertrophic, or impacted by you know, damage or an old um, stomal entrance. And you don't see real thickened mucosal scar in the interior. Then when you're looking at this proximal tracheal, um, the loss of luminal cross-sectional area in the trachea, you know, why is that? Is it thickened gray mucosa or is it a uh, cartilaginous superstructure collapse? Because like you said, you know, superstructure collapse, somebody with post innovation injury with destroyed cartilage, really endoscopic procedures are pretty limited utility in my experience. Maybe slightly temporizing, but um, really they're gonna have a lot more problems than people who just have mucosal disease in their trachea 
the people we commonly encounter, idiopathic subglottic stenosis patients or even GPA patients, where I feel like those people, you know, can get real benefit from endoscopic procedures. Um, so those are the things that I was looking at too. Um, and then just to illustrate, this is a high, a blown up view of the, C, the CT scan I just showed you. And here is a past specimen from a case. And you can really see sort of the superstructure loss and the loss of that C-shape of the cartilaginous proximal trachea, both on the CT and on a surgical specimen, which I feel like approximated it, um, which I feel like was pretty represented, just making me feel like the CT findings match up with what you're going to see uh, in an open resection. That looking for that cartilage disruption is a good indication that he has a, a real problem with the structure there. And I think there's implications for noting that it's a structural problem kind of in some of these next slides. So, so I've got a question for y'all. So how important is it for you to know how the initial tracheotomy was done with these cases? You know, for me, I think it, it's a, it plays a part in trying to understand the pathology of the disease. I think a certain fracture pattern where you're seeing infolding of the anterior surface of the trachea plays a big role. Um, I think those are the, the main ways that I see it impacting what I do. I'm not sure, Sandy, what you feel like. You know, I think we all struggle with how do you try and prevent this superstructure defect. Um, when I when I perform tracheotomy, I, I try and cut in the in the membranous area between two rings. I I think cutting the ring does put you at higher risk for a superstructure defect, but I I don't know that there's a lot of evidence um, that that. I could point to in the literature. That's probably no, my I think that's a No, I think that's a really good point. And I, I struggle with the same thing. How am I going to keep this from happening to the patients that I take care of and I'm doing the primary tracheostomy on? Um, and I think you're right that the technical aspects of the trach matter, but I also feel like there's some biology to this particular kind of patient who has, you know, maybe some sort of inclination towards mucosal inflammation and so some of that inflammatory response from innovation drives pathologic healing and structural remodeling, which is just a guess, but, um, but I'm with you. I try to really be gentle on cartilage when I'm doing these trachs too. So um, the variable I would wonder when you take him in for the OR for the bronch is how, is the, I don't know how obese he is and what's his Malaysia component Presumably he has COPD or some form of it, given his 30 pack year history. And could there be sort of what the, the thoracic surgeons call that saber sheath trachea that sometimes is associated with COPD? Sure. Um, so, you know, good point. You know, he's really one of these people that looks quite healthy, 50 year old guy, pretty skinny, pretty healthy. Um, he works on a, an ambulance truck as an emergency medical technician. So pretty high uh, medical literacy to pretty healthy person. Um, so we take him for, for the bronch the next day. Um, like you said, we kind of watched him overnight with pulse ox monitor and he did fine. And this is what we see. This is the first photo. Okay, so I got a video coming up in a second. This is the first photo. You know, I guess one question, Danny, would what's your plan, your anesthetic plan when you put this guy to sleep? Yeah, so I, I like using high flow oxygen. I've gotten a, where I put a nasal trumpet, usually in the left nasal cavity, and then push air in. Uh, I find it gives me a little longer of a period to get exposure. Works particularly well if there are residents that are getting exposure. And then it lets you operate in the trachea if the patient has decent lungs and not a lot of chest mass for an extended period of time, sometimes up to 30 or 40 minutes. Um, but I would have a small tube ready. Um, and again, this is interesting to me seeing this picture because it's not necessarily what you would anticipate from the CT. Sure. And, and I think CT doesn't always show that soft tissue um, disease as, as well. Sure. Uh, MRI can. 
I think that's a good point. Um, I think for me, the the nasal trumpet with the O2 circuit plugged into it, you know, running O2 is a really great point. And it's really easy to do. And it really provides a lot of extra oxygenation and really gives you an extra cushion, just like you said, to be able to get a tough exposure um, and just keeps the whole team, I think, functioning a little bit higher level with a little less stress. I think it's a great point. And then usually for us, I, you know, I would start with a little bit of propofol and proving that I can mask this patient. And once I do that, then I'll feel good with paralysis and jet ventilation. And, and so that's what we did. Um, I mean, I think people could make a case for all kinds of different ways to take care of him. That was what we sort of started out doing. I feel like, yeah, it would one point would be don't anticipate being able to get a endotracheal tube in the airway. So having a good plan in case that doesn't happen, I think would be what, what I feel like is important with the post intubation stenosis. So as we get in a little closer, just to give people some frame of reference, you know, this is what it looks like when we first expose a current patient. Here's an ISGS patient from the office that I'm showing. So it seems somewhat comparable, um, you know, both pretty tight, uh, both in, you know, below the level of the true vocal folds. But I would just try to highlight, even though this looks the same, the CT finding about the superstructure collapse makes it a little bit of a different case for me. High power view. You can actually see that little white thing underneath is tracheal ring just below the level of that scar. So my point would be have a rigid bronch available because I think that's a useful tool that we don't use all the time in case it's hard to maneuver through the stenosis as a mechanism to enlarge it, um, to you know, move on down, whether we're going to innovate him, whether we're going to uh, put in a T-tube, whether we're going to try to stent him, uh, any of those things. So question, uh, uh, Dr. Gilbar, do you set up a bronch like that for every new dilation? In pretty, much, pretty much every new dilation. Somebody I haven't met before, I have that just available and, you know, rarely use it. But I feel like when, when the time comes when I need it, it's nice to have it ready. So this is what things look like as we got started. You know, you really could barely fit through the four millimeter scope, try to use a balloon to dilate that and it wouldn't move at all. And so really the only way to enlarge that was, you know, progressively larger rigid bronchs. That worked really well to, to make things larger. Um, and so doing that then left us with this. This is after we've dilated it. probably trying to catch up a little bit. So I, I think that's just something I've felt like I've learned over time that the post innovation stenosis patient, there can be a lot of remodeling, a lot of tenacious scar, and it can be hard to, it can be very difficult to dilate with just a standard balloon. Even though it looks a lot like you think a idiopathic patient would look, So the um, let's see. last video just doesn't want to load. I'm going to skip ahead. Basically, with the rigid dilation, you're able to dilate the caliber of the airway a fair amount. So then the question is, well, what are, you going to, what are we going to do at that point? Now that the problem is addressed temporarily, you know, I, as I saw it, I could leave him like that, although I felt like he would rapidly recur you know, over a problem a couple of weeks, he could get a trach, he could get a stent, or he could get a T2. And those are sort of the options that I felt like. I'm not sure if you were thinking, of, if you'd be thinking about it a different way, basically post innovation tracheal stenosis, you've dilated things in the operating room, where are you going to move next for him as a, as a more kind of durable treatment for the next couple of weeks or months? Yeah, I would, I would anticipate the same, that he's not going to do well from the dilation. Um, 
I, I think in my practice, I've seen one patient who had a very short segment iatrogenic scar who, who did fine from a dilation and, and uh, was, was cured. And I would be likely, re even realizing that he's a high risk patient, I would be preparing for um, a tracheal or cricotracheal resection. And would you, so would you be thinking about doing those procedures now? Would you put in an endotracheal tube and plan on the open resection now? Or would you try some sort of temporizing thing, uh, trach, T-tube, stent, to get in to more definitive treatment? I, I you know, if it would, I, I probably wouldn't do any of those things. I would um, probably wake him up and, um, talk to him about a resection. I find a staging bronchoscopy very helpful before going into a resection. Um, the other thing is I, I know that you and Dr. Wooten work together on your airway cases. I have a partner um, who's a thoracic surgeon that I do my um, open tracheal cases with. And so coordinating our schedules can usually take a little bit of time. Um, I do find that most of the iatrogenic patients will do okay for a few weeks, um, as we saw from when they took the T-tube out. But if I had real concerns, I would probably look to schedule something in the next couple of weeks. So kind of likewise, I was trying to weigh, um, you know, whether I'm gonna do some big definitive operation now, just like you're talking about, or temporize him. And I felt like, you know, Certainly, I guess a philosophy that both Chris Wooten and I have is is trying to optimize the physiology of the patient as much as you can in order to get the best result possible. And so for him, the smoking, the the uh, the, the diabetes that was not perfectly controlled, and then the elevated red cell distribution width, I felt like stacked up against him and made him more high risk for me certainly could be done. And if there's no way to manipulate those things, it still would be a reasonable option. But since he, since he wasn't totally um, against the idea of another T-tube or trach, because we talked about it ahead of time, I felt like those things would probably offer him uh, the best possible chance for success is, is how I viewed it. And so, you know, moving ahead, we were kind of thinking, hey, let's give him something that's going to work for the next two months or three months while he gets his glucose under control, stops smoking, and um, we see if we can reverse those things a little bit. Um, the other thing that I do when we're in the OR after dilating the, the airway is taking a piece of tissue and sending it for microbiology because I feel like there's a pretty high prevalence of bad bacteria, especially in the intubated patients, and he grew out E. coli um, from that scar. So I feel like it was a real thing, and we, we subsequently treated that over time. So um, we moving ahead here. We ended up placing a T two, which worked well. Um, just I felt like a trach; he wouldn't be able to speak very well, and he had done well functionally with the T two before, and so I felt like that would be a good temporizing solution. And he ended up. Uh, accommodating the size 14 standard Montgomery T-tube. Um, just showing here how we worked hard to really try to position it just below the phony margins vocal folds and, and have it sort of head out into the central portion of the airway lumen down below. And this is where he grew E. coli. And this is just what things look like with a T-tube in place. So fit well, helped address his problem, you know, temporizing solution to get him through. Um, and all this happened, you know, when he saw us towards the end of the year, last year, we, he saw us in clinic in probably February. The blood sugar was in a good place. He had stopped smoking and um, we had treated the E. coli and his, his red cell distribution width had gone down. And we had him set up for about four weeks after that go to the OR and then COVID happened. And so um, in retrospect, I'm glad that he had the T-tube in and he set up to have surgery in a couple weeks, but he's kind of uh, made it through that. 
this is just what it looked like in the office when he visited with us through a, a well-functioning T-tube. This is just the, the scope going through there. Is the mucosa looks pretty happy. The tube isn't totally occluded. And you can see the glottis phonating above the level of the tube without granulation tissue or significant inflammation. And for whatever it's worth, I, I think the patient experience with stuff is is really relevant. And he wanted to kind of tell his story a little bit. Don't take it for now. Don't want to actually do a surgery that should fix the problem. Uh, as far as the T two, I haven't experienced not being able to breathe. It's a lot better having the T two. That was quite an experience because that's an all when the swelling occurred and trying to, I like being able to breathe through my mouth and nose. And of course, with the drink, you don't. You breathe out your neck, out the drink. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't really talk with the drake in. Even mm -hmm. then, your finger on the drake, the drake was too big for me to get any air past it to my, to my foot before she talk. I just been able to talk, but I can't get stressed how much relief that gives me mentally and nothing else to be able to talk. So, um, you know, doing really well with this temporizing measure, it is a, a pretty impermanent solution. And I think he'll be a very good candidate now that we've tried to tune things up to, um, to proceed to an open reconstruction. And, you know, I, I feel like we've done, you know, both the patient and his team have done everything to try to optimize his physiology. So that would be the, the other principle, just that, that we're working hard to try to manage that. Um, prior to the OR. But um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Garrett and Dr. Fletcher a little bit and say thanks again, Zanny, for taking time out of your day to weigh in and, and talk a little bit about these airway cases. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Andy. All right. Uh, okay. So we are actually going to talk about clearly more serious things than airway. We're going to talk about hoarseness. So we're really changing gears here. Um, so, all right. So, you know, one of my big things is, is kind of really making sure that we continue to have the art of medicine in mind as we take care of our patients. And, you know, clearly when we're seeing patients in the voice center, you know, we're talking about quality of life and, 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 and really to me, it's, it's, it's establishing that relationship with your patient and getting to know them. And that, you know, a lot of that, actually feeds into how we manage them. So, you know, that's to me one of the big things. So I kind of want to put that in there real quick. But, um, you know, when, when a patient comes in, when we look at their complaint, you know, hoarseness is kind of the term that's used. And we always talk about hoarseness as being kind of the dizziness for our etology colleagues, because it really doesn't say a whole lot, uh, quite honestly. Um, and the definition of hoarseness is it's a symptom of altered voice quality is reported by patients, which also then brings up the definition of voice. Uh, voice is different than speech. You know, voice is, is the sound produced by the larynx and uttered via the mouth. I mean, you could, you could not understand a word the person is saying, but yet you could analyze what their, what their voice sounds like. Um, so to, to um, differ that from the term dysphonia, which is kind of a clinical uh, diagnosis that's given to represent impaired voice production. And I, I will tell you, it's interesting, a lot of patients come in and, and they will tell me that they've you know, read online about their symptoms and, and they know what they have because they, you know, they've, they've done all these searches and they, and they say, I have dysphonia. So um, I, I have to explain to them that that, that also is relatively nonspecific, but, but it is a great term uh, to use uh, for our patients. So at the voice center, you know, voice problems, um, you know, there aren't a ton of things that uh, can cause voice problems. I kind of threw a, 
kind of a mishmash up there of the different things that that we're thinking about with voice. Um, and then, you know, at the bottom, I highlighted weird stuff because we do see a fair amount of weird stuff. We've seen some weird stuff even this week that affect the voice. And, you know, to me, one of the great things about laryngology is that we do a lot of, of detective work because uh, patients come in with a set of symptoms and signs uh, often, and it's not always straightforward what what they have going on. And uh, so to me, that's that's really one of the great things about, about our subspecialty. Um, so, you know, doing a lot of detective work. Our, our residents and our fellows kind of hear us talking about that all the time. So just to have a little bit of, uh, of relative science um, thrown in, you know, clinical practice guidelines are what the Academy has sponsored uh, for years about various things that, that we treat in, in otolaryngology. And one of the first CPGs that came out in laryngology was called the hoarseness uh, CPG. In fact, it didn't even have dysphonia at the time when it first came out. Um, and the first one came out in 2009, and there was a lot of controversy associated with it. Um, this, this updated one came out in 2018, and our own David Francis, who was one of our former fellows, was probably the, even though he's second author, in, he, he really was the spearhead of, of coming up with how we evaluate uh, dysphonia as opposed to a, a symptom of hoarseness. Um, and out of that CPG came a series of recommendations. And, and by definition, strong recommendations under a CPG, you know, there's, there, there's not a lot, I'll be honest with you, for laryngology, but a strong recommendation is that the benefit clearly exceeds the harm with high level of supporting evidence. And so with that, we should be, you know, we should be following those, those recommendations unless there's really a good reason not to. Um, so the strong recommendations for hoarseness is identify factors requiring expedited evaluation. And here's just a list of some of those things. And then referral for voice therapy as appropriate. And that's really it. The next level is just recommendation. So there's lower level of supporting evidence for this, but there's enough um, expert opinion that says we ought to be doing these things. And for hoarseness, these were a lot of the things that came out of it. And most importantly, though, are these three that I highlighted, because these actually were not in, in the first one that came out in 09, which is one of the parts of the controversy. It actually allowed people to treat a voice change and not take a look at the actual structure causing the voice change for three months. And uh, that was felt certainly to be inappropriate. Um, so, so we now have that highlighted. Um, there are some strong recommendations against, such as routinely prescribing antibiotics, and recommendations against, which are basically ordering testing and treatment prior to actually looking at the larynx. Seems kind of common sense, but those were not in the first one. So going back to the art of the diagnosis. Um, you know, we really start evaluating our patients from the minute we actually look at the, com the presenting uh, complaint or diagnosis, but also when we see them walking down the hall, when they're being put in the room by our nurses. And, you know, oftentimes we can actually hear their voices uh, in that intake. So that really begins our diagnosis. So, you know, there are actually clues you can get in the EHR and the intake prior to you ever actually meeting the patient in person. Um, you, you see their age, it starts making you think about differentials about their problem, their occupation, the history that's in there, medications they're on. And just as an example, so an 80 year old male, you've got this on your, on your clinic list, you have an 80-year-old male coming in with progressive hoarseness for six months. And so I'm going to ask Dr. Fletcher um, <clears throat> what he's thinking about when he sees this person. What is he anticipating uh, he's going to potentially find in this patient? Um, so certainly age groups make a difference. Um, you know, you'd like to know his other past medical history and other uh, 
factors that may lead to hoarseness, such as smoking history, other medical problems. Um, and also in this age group, you're going to be thinking of other uh, just more general medical problems that may lead to hoarseness. Um, so, you know, I'd like to obviously look at his intake, see how things are going um, and listen to him too. I think, you know, even our nurses sometimes can come out and tell us what they think they have just by listening to us, just, just from the experience. And so, you know, we're listening and based on kind of what we're hearing um, and um, will help us, but even just looking at kind of what, um, what we have on our pre intake will help a lot. Um, yeah. And <clears throat> excuse me. And so with an 80 year old, you know, you're also thinking, age-related changes, uh, things like that. So, you know, this is a little bit um, kind of old-fashioned at this point, since we're not doing a lot of a lot of handwritten intakes anymore, although we still try to do them at the voice center um, because we're all trying to go paperless. And this was this, this gentleman's intake. And presumably, you know, he started filling it out. And, you know, you can actually get a lot of information from just looking at how they how they filled it out. So, um, Chuck, what what uh, what do you see with this intake sheet? Um, so, you know, looking at the handwriting here, it, it's unlikely that this is normal historically for this gentleman. Although it may be something that has slowly changed for him. I mean, I, I would be thinking neurologic changes. Uh, you know, and, and I would even kind of ask at this point, um, even if you're not in the um, uh, not in the room and starting to look at medications and see if there are other diseases. I'd be thinking something like Parkinson's disease or other movement disease disorders, and they may have that diagnosis already, uh, and that might be on the next page, uh, or that you might be the first person to kind of start thinking about those kinds of questions to ask. So this, I, I would look at this and think it's Parkinson's until proven otherwise, just based on how it looks. Yeah, the micrographia, and you know, the, we we can also tell people who are sent. Uh, they've got the diagnosis of spasmodic dysphonia. You can look at their handwriting and you actually can see tremor in the handwriting. So that also uh, helps make you think that, hmm, you know, when I go in there, I'm going to be wondering if they've got uh, a voice tremor as well as the hand tremor. Um, so here's this gentleman. So here's what his voice sounds like. Hopefully. Oh, no. I don't know why that's not playing. Well, let's see if the, let's see if the, there we go. So, just three for a second. Well, this is not boding well for a laryngology talk to not have the, the video playing. Um, Breathe in, do it again. So instead I'll explain what it looks like. So the, first of all, the voice, um, very soft, very monotone. I mean, basically, it was uh, you know the division. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shapes. Uh, this one's not working. Oh, there it is working. You're right. Thank you. <laughs> so there you go. You can hear it now. I hope. Okay. And you always you also hear in that kind of that hurried kind of speech that you would see. And I often think about with uh, patients with Parkinson's disease, I think about their voice often like their their mobility and walking that way too. So breathe in, do it again. All right. Okay. So so indeed this gentleman ended up having Parkinson's. Um, and, you know, this is all very consistent, but we could have guessed it would have been something like this even before we, before we went in and uh, looked at the larynx. Just... All right, so here, here's another case. Um, so it's kind of a little, a little bit like oral boards here, but, um, you know, 18-year-old female with voice issue for one year. So... So when I go in and, and talk to this person, one of the first things I always ask every patient is, I wanna know from their perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, what is different about their voice? And you know, because I'll hear their voice and I may have a, com <clears throat> a personal comment about what I think I hear, because now my voice is going hoarse, 
Um, and then the other thing I always ask is, is the voice ever normal? Um, so any, what else? Well, yeah, especially if they say the voice is normal at times, you know, to me, that's an immediate, then there's likely a, less likely a structural issue uh, because <laughs> if there's something there, it'd be unlikely to kind of normalize. But, uh, but those are two very important things. I also want to know, like, was there, what was happening around the time that it changed? You know, was there a specific incident that made it happen? Um, you know, was this something that, you know, she can pinpoint the day it happened or was it just gradual? Um, and then certainly, you know, anything else related to it, changes in swallowing, breathing, um, anything new or different, you know, what kind of activities they do, their job is very important, especially in Nashville where everyone's singing. Uh, you know, we certainly um, see that as a factor in this age group here where we've been thinking about, um, you know, what are they trying to achieve with their voice and what is it, when it changed, what were they doing? Um, and so you can see here kind of all those things are um, important to all of us, but those, especially the normalization and what happened uh, to start the problem. Yeah, and, and I think this is kind of the sleuthing part of it, <clears throat> trying to figure out, you know, what may be contributing. Um, <clears throat> So here's her voice. Maybe. When the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, they act like a prism and form a rainbow. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of a long round arch with its path high above and its two ends apparently beyond the horizon. Okay, so I think Chuck yeah. probably will <laughs> agree with me what yeah, I mean, this is like where I'm like, oh, so what is wrong with your voice? I mean, yeah. you know, these are the ones where you really have to know what they think is wrong with it based on that sound. Yeah, I mean, I said maybe a little mild roughness, but really not a bad voice. But then, you know, you ask them about, is it singing? Is it is it their talking voice? Is, is, this, is this a good day versus a bad day? Um, and so these are some of the other things in her history that I think are pertinent. Um, so uh, when all the slew thing, this is what you know, information you're gathering and, and, you know, this, she, she's pretty handicapped by this voice issue. I mean, she can't even participate in class at this point. Um, she, someone else had suggested that she do voice rest and it did not help at all. Um, you know, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the discomfort with her voice, uh, is also an important thing to, to see and as well as her past history of anxiety and irritable bowel um, but you know dr fletcher mentioned earlier about the fact that when the voice is normal at times then you're thinking maybe it's less of a structural issue and more uh, factors that are related outside of the larynx so here's her exam <laughs> Now, if I were really bold, I'd ask one of the residents on there what, what they think about that exam. Um, but I don't know. I mean, again, I, this, this looks like a pretty normal exam under stroboscopy. Um, I, I, I will say, though, I gave this, this uh, case at a, at a panel discussion, and, and one of the panelists started, started kind of highlighting some things that indicated there may be reflux going on. And most of the people on the panel said, no, this looks pretty normal. But the response I got from the panelist was, well, she clearly has complaints, so there must be something going on on the exam. So, you know, um, I, to me, I think that's a little disconnect uh, between what you're seeing and what you're hearing. So, I think these are other important things to highlight. And then, interestingly, she ironically is not a music major, which is a lot of what these new college students are coming in um, uh, doing, um, but she's majoring in exercise physiology and has been working out a whole lot more as a freshman than she ever did. 
And so, um, you know, this is a patient that's representative of what's going on with her. This is a woman that we saw that this was how she looked at rest um, and clearly see a lot of that neck tension and her exam shows a lot of superglottic tension as well. Um, so that's, that's a good example of muscle tension dysphonia with cervicalgia and uh, um, you know, that, that, that's, how we, uh, that's how we approach that 18 year old and she did well with voice therapy and with physical therapy. So I'm not gonna go a whole lot into details with this because I do wanna get to our last case. Um, but just to show that, that you know, we're very fortunate to have a voice and speech language pathologist that are with us in the clinic and it's very helpful, not only for the perceptual voice evaluation, but also helping us out with the video strobe exams. Um, these are just two, two methods of doing perceptual analysis, two scales that are used. Um, and then as we look at the larynx, uh, transoral approaches with our rigid, rigid 70 degree or 90 degree scopes and a transnasal approach. These are just general differences between those two scopes. And I'm gonna skip this exam, but these two I do want you to look at though, because this left exam is done with a flexible scope. And even though they have distal chip cameras, um, uh, well, these videos are not playing well. But anyway, I think even with the still picture, you can see a difference between the quality. It's almost like there's a filter over this left one and on the right, a much, uh, much better look. And this actually happens to be um, one of the patient I'm about to show. So let's get to that. <laughs> 